My name is Rana Mitter, and I'm the author of Forgotten Ally, China's World War II, 1937 to 1945. The story of China in World War II is one of the last great unknown stories of possibly one of the most famous world conflicts. And it's really very strange that we haven't known in the West what happened to China during World War II for so many decades, because the effect on China was devastating. We're talking about 14 million or more Chinese being killed, 80 to 100 million becoming refugees, the tentative modernization that was happening in China before the war being smashed into pieces. And all of this came together to really shape, to create the China that we actually know today, the rising superpower. And yet that experience of the Chinese people resisting Japan and coming through those eight years of war is simply very little known. That was the reason that I decided to take advantage of a new opportunity, the chance to use new archives, new materials that have only been made available in mainland China in, let's say, the last five to ten years, and write this story, not exactly from scratch, but certainly for the first time in English as a complete narrative from the beginning to the end, just to explain what happened and why. I mean, you might ask, why should a war that devastated China over eight years, the war against Japan, have been forgotten? After all, it was a huge uh, event. It was a terrifying experience for so many millions of Chinese who lived through it. And of course, many millions of deaths and refugees as well during that time. And the answer really is that the war disappeared down a black hole created by the Cold War. After 1945, there was no great interest in Mao's China in talking about World War II in detail. And the reason for that was very simple. A very large part of the fighting had been done not by Mao's Communist Party. They were important, let's not get that wrong. But actually, a vast amount of the fighting was done by Mao's great enemy, Chiang Kai-shek, the leader of nationalist China, who of course fled to Taiwan after the civil war in 1949. And that meant that that actually very significant contribution of four million or more nationalist troops who helped to hold back the Japanese simply couldn't be discussed in communist China. But this is not just about communist China forgetting this particular piece of history. It's about us in the West as well. In 1945, Japan was a defeated enemy and China was a partial, uh, reluctant, but real ally. Just five years later, by the beginning of the Cold War, 1949-1950, the positions had reversed. China was now this great unknown communist giant that we could no longer talk to, and Japan, of course, was a Cold War ally. And that meant that going back to the many atrocities and horrors that happened in World War II in China simply didn't fit the tenor of those Cold War times. It took the post-Cold War era, many decades later, for us finally to be able to tell the full and detailed version of this story. The end of World War II was a very long time ago, 1945, and yet in some ways there is no event that is as linked to China's global rise today as what I'd call the unfinished business of 1945. Because when the war ended in Asia, the atomic bombings, of course, of Japan, bringing it to a sudden and terrible close, what was notable was what did not happen. Let's compare it for a moment to the North Atlantic, to the United States and to Europe. Of course, Europe also lay devastated after the war against Hitler. But in the place of the fascist regimes, there came instead a new order. The European Union, NATO, of course, a Cold War embedded these uh, particular phenomena. But at the same time, we have to remember that a relatively stable, relatively um, a regularized system of, uh, of government and of international governance emerged in the North Atlantic. Nothing like that ever happened in East Asia after 1945. The region was divided very fast and very suddenly into two, in, into two opposing blocks. Japan, of course, part of the American-dominated order in the Pacific, and China, of course, the world's newest and biggest communist state. And for that reason, the kind of multilateral organizations that emerged in Europe at that time never appeared in Asia. We're now paying the price for that because one of the things that's very evident is that the conversation that's going on in East Asia today, right now, is often very spiky. And often worse than that, it can get 
very, very heated, often to a dangerous level, whether it's China and Japan arguing over small islands in the East China Sea, or um, China arguing that the United States should no longer be giving its protection to a whole variety of Asian and Southeast Asian powers, or simply the inability of countries in the region to talk within a wider transnational structure. All of these are the products of a failure in 1945 of all sides to come together and deal with the aftermath of the terrifying war that had been fought between China, Japan, and ultimately also the United States and the British Empire.